Welcome to Prepare Like a Pro. It's uh, me once again, Woman Grandmaster Talia Cervantes. And today we're going to be uh, taking a look at a topic that I find quite interesting. Uh, we can take it more of a dis as a discussion, right? Than just me explaining something and you guys reacting to it. Um, I kind of want us to talk about these two examples there from uh, two games of mine during a tournament that I played in May called the Continental, uh, the Absolute Continental Championship. It's a, it's kind of a very big deal. It's a qualifying tournament. The top four spots get a spot at the World Cup. So it was very competitive. I finished 12th actually, which is not bad. Uh, I started 30th, 31st in the ranking, something like that. And this this game right here um, is kind of the start of a learning process that I had during the tournament and it has to do a lot with realizing your mistakes especially during a tournament when you don't have as much time as you know in the process of preparation to fix whatever is wrong because you literally have a game next day right so uh, it's very important to always analyze your games even a little bit after you finish um, a game at a tournament and then uh, figure out what went wrong and be conscious of it for the next couple of rounds, right? I don't know if you guys have ever had moments like this uh, where you kind of realize during a tournament that something is going wrong or that something is not working out. Um, for example, uh, recently um, I played the U.S. Juniors, U.S. Junior Girls, as some of you may know. And what maybe you don't know is that right after, like two days after, I decided to play this uh, round robin I am norm tournament. And during the first three or four rounds, I actually felt like I was playing pretty bad. And it did show in my game. I was missing moves and I was uh, taking too long and I was a little self-conscious in my variations and all of that. So... Um, I feel like, especially after round four, there was kind of this shift of what do I do to fix it, right? And most of the times I feel like it's better to acknowledge whatever problem you notice while playing your tournament than pretend that everything is fine to put yourself in a good mood. I feel like that doesn't work, at least for me, it never ends up working. So probably for the best um, is to acknowledge the... The mistakes right and see see how to fix them so for example during this tournament that i was talking about the i am known tournament i decided to play more practical i didn't um, go into such depth and complex um, calculations and i tried to just play as easy breezy as i could and make my positions you know just very natural where my moves come to mind um, simply and it ended up working. I kind of saved the tournament and it was all good. So um, I want to talk about this specific game and this example right here. I think you guys are able to see the position from the white side right now. And it is white to move. But before anything, I kind of want to ask you guys your opinion um, on, on this position and what you think is going on, right? So like based on material at first and king safety, Placement of the pieces, how active the pieces are, and then pawn structure, obviously. So, anyone in the chat or here, I guess, feel free to um, to just say whatever you think about this position. It doesn't have to be super concrete. You don't have to give like full-on variations at the moment, but just kind of like your thoughts on how the position looks so far, and I guess like if you were white pieces here, how would you continue? This came from a from a King's Indian, by the way, as weird as that made sound. Uh, it came from a King's Indian, a sandwich variation where I allow my opponent to play C takes D4, Knight takes D4. Then we got kind of a Marozzi setup, and there was a pawn on C4, a pawn on D6. I played C5, they got traded off, and that's how we got here. So, any thoughts? 
Maybe I should color this. Just to make sure. Um, yeah, so one person is saying that white seems kind of stuck. I guess I could agree with that. Like our, the white pieces, it's not so clear to see where they're going to next, right? Um, I feel like this bishop right here, at least for the moment, it does a really good job at closing up the file and not allowing, you know, any pressure to happen, especially on the knight on c3, right? Um, but can the, the question is, can the bishop stay there, right? Because black also has some ideas of retreating with the knight. The, the thing is that if either knight goes to d7, you got to take into consideration... Uh, oops, you got to take into consideration bishop takes e7, right? Like if the knight goes back. So there's a lot of calculation. There's a little bit of calculation involved as well. Um, another person is saying, I like a4 to create some weaknesses in the queen side. That's very interesting. Yeah, so a4 trying to provoke some, some issues on that side. I guess the main question, yeah, the main question is just how, how does white continue in this turn? And... They have to play very fast because soon after, you know, black is going to try and get rid of this bishop. And if this bishop falls, the whole position kind of crumbles a little bit. So in terms of evaluation, uh, this position right now is at about equal. White has to play very precisely. A move like a4 makes a lot of sense. Uh, but there is kind of one move here from white that deserves a lot of a lot of analysis, right? Because it's very immediate. Um, maybe you guys can try and, and give me your thoughts. I, in this position, I had seen this line coming from a few moves ago. And I decided to play pawn to f4. Right. Pawn to f4, you guys are mentioning it. Yes, so... After pawn to f4, you know, serious calculation needs to needs to be done. Because, for example, if something like knight to d7, suddenly the white position can be very good, right? Um, something like pawn to, pawn to e5, let's say, kind of, you know, brings some, some attention. And if the knight goes back, knight to d5, right? And... All of a sudden, there are some issues here. And the queen, of course. So, it's very important to, to still be realistic in the position, right? And try to understand what is going on. The thing is that black has a very, very nice sequence that allows them to escape these problems. And I didn't realize this once I decided to play pawn to f4. Um, there is a way here that black can start to, to escape the issue. So for example, after knight d7, pawn to e5, which is what ended up happening, how can, white con how can black continue? I'm gonna flip the board to see if it's easier, um, because at least for, for this turn, uh, it's kind of a question of black to move. But are you, do you think that black is completely doomed or is there some resource? I like how one comment says maybe a four, but it seems sharp. Yeah, it is actually um, quite sharp. So try and figure out how this ends for black. And like I said, it can be more of a discussion. So just, I guess, whatever your thoughts are um, about the position, feel free to, to voice them. But certainly there was a lot going on that I didn't notice at first. And it was when it was my turn to make a move and to make a decision, and I was actually seeing all of the resources going on, it was too late. So, yeah. Okay, so we have one comment that says knight takes c5 and after pawn takes, bishop takes f6. What do you guys think? Is this, uh, is this enough uh, for, is this enough for, for black or are they doomed after 
let's say in ID one or context. The thing is that the moves kind of flow naturally here for black, right? Oh wait, someone is saying knight g4 followed by knight e5. Oh, knight g4 followed by knight e5. I feel like that's a little slow. Knight g4, I'm going to uh, just take it, I think. Either with knight or bishop. Actually, the, the correct variation is knight c5, pawn takes, bishop takes. And the question is after it takes, takes. How does the position evaluate, right? Um, Obviously, you know, the two knights are hanging at the moment, and that's a very big issue that white has to deal with. But not only that, the pawn on a2 is probably going to fall soon after, and black has the bishop pair, right? So it makes it very difficult for white to even try and keep some control of the position where black, when black has the bishop pair, um, especially with these two pawns in some sort of endgame or in the future. It's going to be quite hard to, to uh, keep the pawns tamed, right? Even if white has a piece more. And it's very uncomfortable how everything turns out because it's not like the queen can move over to the D file and try to help out the pieces or help this knight here on, the, on E3. It's a little difficult to, to save at all. So yeah, you guys are saying knight to, knight to D1. Um, and that's kind of what ended up happening in the game. So after takes, takes, I with the white pieces played knight cd1. It's kind of a transposition. Um, but after bishop to d4, takes, queen takes um, c5. We ended up getting this. And it's very hard for me to defend this knight right here. And of course, um, black is threatening takes and then takes with the rook on c2. So after queen takes c5, rook takes c5, takes, takes, you may think, okay, we traded a couple of pieces, like there's no way that white is under any risk right now. But the position is still so much easier to play from the pr practical point of view for, for black. Because not only is this been very difficult to get out of, black is threatening right now, rook takes d1, bishop takes e3, and bishop takes a2. So there are a lot of threats happening at the moment. There's also rook, e, rook d2, right? With the idea of attacking both the bishop and the pawn on a2. And I feel like this pawn right here, you can kind of keep, uh, take it for a lost pawn already. Um, so this is how the game played out. And I'm just going to show you a few more moves. We don't need to see the whole game because my opponent actually gave me some chances. And we got to an opposite color bishop. Um, end game and it was always winning for him but I don't know why he allowed me to 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 even get to that point but after king f2 bishop takes a2 knight c3 bishop e6 knight e5 bishop d4 the position all of a sudden just became uh, very very uncomfortable he went back with the bishop to to c8 trying to put it on b7 relocate it and keep everything under control we ended up moving the pieces around, and it was around the time where uh, we were getting closer to time control. So both of us were a little bit low on time. There were a few moments where maybe I could have tried to hold on, but it was just very difficult. And as you can see here, um, this bishop can come here and here, and the position is just almost unbearable, right? So after knight to c5, even bishop to f5, and suddenly, you know, I can't keep the control of everything. There are just too many threats, right? The two bishops are very annoying. That's why usually I prefer playing with the two bishops. But of course here I had to play against them. And yeah, it was just uh, completely losing for, for white. And I went on to lose this game. It was my only loss from the tournament. I scored like 8 out of 11. 8.5 out of 11, something like that. Um, but yeah, it was 8 out of 11. But the thing is that, um, the thing is that, you know, after I finished this game, I realized, okay, this F4 right here, it was, you know, a little bit rushed. 
maybe I could have tried to play more calm, like Rook D1 or something, and it would have been uh, probably for the best. But in the way that I played, I overextended a little bit. There is a saying, I mentioned it during um, US Juniors in one of the interviews, actually. There is a saying that F4 is always wrong, um, which is a shame because it's also my favorite move to do in most of positions. Um, I like having space, so I like playing F4. I play the four pawns attack against the Kings Indian sometimes. It's just a, like a move that I like to do. But I do realize that oftentimes, even when it has you know the best intentions of kicking pieces back, it creates too many weaknesses. And um, after I finished this game, I talked to my coaches and they were telling me, you know, be careful over extending, moving your pawns too much, keep this in mind for future rounds, right? And at first I was just, you know, kind of listening as normal, like, sure, um, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to keep an eye on that. But then one of my coaches said something kind of funny. Um, he said, uh, what did he say? Oh, yeah, <laughs> he said, um, uh, try to play like Karpov. What would Karpov do in this position? I was just looking, at, I mean, I wasn't looking at him because I was texting him, but I was just like, what do you mean? Like, I can't play like Karpov. If I could, I would do it. But obviously, I'm not Karpov, right? Um, but he just kind of wanted me to play more, uh, I guess, uh, prophylactic and try to slowly but surely squeeze the life out of my opponent rather than, um, rather than overextend too much or rush things out in a position. Uh, so I kind of kept that in mind and I feel like it's a, it's a very important, you know, when you play your games, especially in, in official tournaments, always important to keep in mind what your weaknesses are too, right? And be very conscious of them and make sure that you're not falling into their trap, right? While, you, while you're playing, getting carried away by the moment. So I kept this in mind. Um, and next game I was black pieces. I won my game relatively easy. I was playing, um, like much lower rated opponent. And then I was white pieces again, um, against another international master, by the way, this guy that I played was an international master. And in the next round, I was playing another international master, right? With the white pieces. So I was thinking, okay, I'm going to try and not overextend. And I'm going to try to maneuver my pieces as best as I can and watch out for any F4 that I could do because uh, probably it's not going to be good. Play like Carpo, so that's what I've been doing wrong. Yeah, I mean, um, everybody has a different style. I just tried to be more conscious of my mistake in this, um, in this specific tournament. But... Yeah, if I could play like Karpov every day, I would, um, um, like, without any questions, right? It's not really a... <laughs> I just don't think I can. It was just kind of a... Remembering at most points during this game, like, oh, be very careful not to overextend, how to take away uh, opportunities from the opponent, right? And that led us on to this game. So pawn to d4, pawn to g6, c4, bishop g7. They're actually from the same country. They play similar openings. I don't know if that's just a thing, but um, yeah. It was amazing to see how the two bishops and the pawn were better than the two knights and the bishop. Yeah, like the pair of bishop was just so strong in that position and it looked exactly how it needed to look. Um, yeah. But okay, uh, knight c3, pawn to c5, pawn to d5. Usually these openings um, tend to be quite fine for for white, even if the pawns are doubled. Uh, black gave away their best piece or their best bishop, right, for doubling up the two pawns right here. And oftentimes, you know, the main line is going pawn to f5. It... Uh, controls a little bit of space, they want to play knight f6 next turn, and there are even lines where white plays with e4, pawn takes f3, you get something like this, some files in the center are open, and there are even ideas of bishop d3, bring the bishop to h6 if the knight develops, playing h4, h5. Position just tends to be practically better, uh, easier to play for white. 
Um, so, yeah. However, my opponent didn't play like this with f5, he played with e5. And I was a bit surprised because I had never seen this move before. But if you think about it, it kind of, it kind of makes sense. Because he's going to try and put the pawns on the opposite color as the bishop that he has, right? So he gave up the dark square bishop. It makes sense to put the pawns on dark square now that that bishop is gone. So the squares are covered and the other bishop, you know, just has a free way to work um, in the opposite color. But after pawn to e5, pawn to e4, d6, bishop d3, I was just trying to make some normal moves. Knight d7, knight e2. I feel like there are a few different setups that you can use. Um, you can also put the knight on f3, and that is completely fine. Personally, I am a sandwich player, so I'm so used to putting my knight on e2, playing with the pawn on f3, and then seeing what happens. But after knight to e2, queen to e7, castle, uh, knight to f6, everything looks quite normal so far. f4, it might look a little bit tempting. Um, kind of but uh, the main issue is that after takes and let's say bishop takes uh, the square on e5 will always be available for this knight to jump to and it will be an outpost and since there is no longer a pawn on the f file you won't be able to kick it away with f4 right obviously they can't do it right now because there is bishop to g5 uh, but let's say after something like h6 it doesn't have to be quite immediate. Black can even, actually, black can even probably do something like castle, play king g7, try to put the knight here. But even after something like h6, the knight can have ideas already of jumping over to, to e5. Not even h6, you can even consider something like knight g4, knight e5, right? And, you know, long term, it's going to be difficult for white to, to regain control of the position where, white, where black has such a strong knight on e5. Um, so I decided to just play with f3, kind of keeping it tame. King to d8, and I mean, honestly, I had my opponent was kind of blitzing out all of these moves, and I hadn't even considered king to d8. I feel like it's not really my fault. Like, king to d8 just seems so unnatural. Uh, but he clearly just wants to put the king on the, on the queen side, keeping it safe. Uh, maybe, you know, if he had castled the king short, he would have to deal with my bishop, right? and some weaknesses around the king. So he probably didn't want to go through that. Um, and he might use the queen side, the king side in the future for some ideas of g5, g4, uh, maybe breaking open my, my castle king and try to get some counterplay on this side for the lack of space that they have in the center. So I think that this was the idea that my opponent had. And after king to d8, um, I was still a little bit confused trying to understand what my plan was. I decided to go bishop to e3. Maybe it's not the most necessary of moves, uh, but it's still fine. King c7, queen d2, knight to h4. I played pawn to a4. My opponent played pawn to a5. And here, you know, so far up until this point, I have been spending like about 5 to 10 minutes on each move. Just trying to understand what the ideas are because I feel like most of my moves up until now have been isolated, right? So like bishop b3 is an isolated move. a4 has a completely different idea. So now I'm trying to think a little bit deeper about the position and trying to understand what is my plan going to be. So it was at this moment, right, that it kind of popped back into my mind the idea of, okay, what would Karpov do here? And, you know, if Karpov was playing this position, he would probably... Uh, severely punish black for uh, giving white all of this space and just keep on pushing the pieces back right into war squares to the point where black gets completely suffocated so how should white continue in this position if they want to have some sort of idea like that Okay, we got one suggestion, rook a b1, g3 comes to mind, 
but it's hard to plan to find a plan for white for sure. There's one g4, two people are saying g4. I guess it's kind of like, yeah, which side of the board do you want to play? Because certainly you can play something like rook to b1. Um, it's kind of one of, it's one of the moves that I was considering in this position. Um, but I wasn't sure if it was, you know, if it was going to do anything. Because the pawn is obviously going to b6, right? From, from black. It does make sense, you know, you bring the rook over to a semi-open file. We march the king to the b file for safety. <laughs> we might, I mean, we might do a few things before that. We might do a few things before that. Bishop to h6, I feel like that moves make sense. Um, but there is a way that you can... Uh, there is a way that you can, like you know, make it a, a cohesive sequence of moves, right? <laughs> F4 could be fun. I don't know if it's accurate, though. I feel like F4 is, even if it's, you know, even if it works, I feel like it's doing what black wants, what black wants, white to do right because after f4 you know before white kind of had most of the control in the position now it can be a fight for control right so i feel like this is what black wants the position is very locked up but it's certainly white who has the, the, the more of the control right You guys keep wanting to play f4, and that makes me feel better because, <laughs> like I said, um, f4, it's kind of a move that I really like making. But obviously, there are some consequences in this specific pawn structure. The pawn on e5 actually helps us, right? Because it doesn't allow black to put a knight there. So, all right, let's see what happened. Rook to v1, pawn to v6. So it does make sense. Just keep the keep the position, you know, kind of collected. I feel like bringing the rook to b1. We mentioned it. Play pawn to b6. Just kind of getting things ready, right? And now I still say g4. Okay, well, we might need to go for g4. Um, the point of g4 is very interesting, actually. So there are some, there are some, some things that need to be kind of calculated, but overall it's not too bad, right? Like for example, it's not like our king is going to check, get checkmated after we play pawn to b4. Um, so pawn to, pawn to g4, sorry. Uh, it's not like our king is going to get checkmated after it, right? We still have a lot of pieces around. Knight to f4 doesn't quite work because after takes, 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 bishop gets a good diagonal. And the difference is that whenever this knight goes to e5, we do have pawn to f4, right? So eventually something like, not that, something like bishop g3 and f4 and e5 is coming. So not just, you know, a pawn up, but also white has an initiative. And in the game, my opponent decided to play knight to g7 and then bishop to h6, right? And... The whole point of this variation is to make sure that after the knight goes away, they don't have pawn to h5 because then they start fighting for counterplay, right? But if I play bishop to h6, I shut everything down. Uh, there's not going to be any h5. There's not going to be any f5 either uh, because after something like pawn takes, takes, bishop takes, I eliminate the, the defender of the pawn and I'm going to play bishop takes f5, put my knight on g3. Position is okay. Uh, it's not enough compensation for sacrificing a pawn here for, for black. So kind of the whole point is to keep on restricting the position and what is going on. Um, if the knight has gone to f6, 
I feel like something similar would happen. I will probably bring my bishop over to h6 just to make sure that things are completely shut down. And the good thing about knight to knight to f6 is that I also have ideas of g5, right? So I can I can even consider something like here and knight here. And whenever black tries to play like h6, trying to open things up, I can just take and I have enough pieces protecting that pawn, right? So. Oh yes, yeah, so if you want to play something like this and bishop h6, you can't really play knight g8 to kick up my bishop because I have bishop to g7. Funny enough, and it just goes on to show how, how tied up the, the pieces are. I gave away the idea when you, when I said play like Karpov. Uh, I mean, then remind yourself on every turn to play like Karpov and you're going to give yourself the hint. <laughs> um, but yeah, so g4, knight to g7 was played, bishop h6, rook to g8, knight to g3, makes sense, controlling even more the square here on f5. And the whole point now is just going to keep on restricting black and making sure that they don't have any pawn break, right? Because then our, the position of our king becomes a little bit more weakened. So we just got to make sure that we don't allow any pawn break and then the position should be fine. Bishop to a6. Rook to f2, I was just kind of making moves uh, going around. Rook f2 is always helpful, it just controls the second file, the second rank, sorry. And um, yeah, just make sure that nothing is going on. And when I play h4, there's not going to be any f5, right? Because I have like bishop to g5 and everything is under control. So rook to f8 was played, king to g2, rook to h1, just bringing the pieces over to where they make sense. Knight to e8, and now it's kind of about time. Like, obviously you can spend a couple of moves maneuvering around, but now it's time to come up with the second phase of the plan, right? Which pawn break do you want to do? Do you still want to play f4? Do you want to play h5? Do you want to play pawn to g5? So you start taking these things into consideration. And for whenever pawn, whatever pawn break you are thinking of having here on the king side, there's one piece of ours that we might need to get out of the way first, right? And how, how do we do that? Yes, you should still be scared that f4 is giving black the e5 square. Again, Karpov style, we don't need to have a pawn break right now. We can keep on preparing things until our position is the most optimal. And again, you don't need to give me like a, like a tactical variation or anything, just kind of like what your ideas are in the position and what you think is the best chance here for for white and how to continue or if you just have any questions about the position i'm willing to answer them so just feel free to voice whatever you think is going on right now as if it was your own game move king to the queen side how does that sound? Moving the king all the way over to the queen side. Does that make sense or is that a waste of time? What do you guys think? I know there were some mentions of it before. I am not taking challenges right now. <laughs> Wrong stream, yeah, I'm doing a lecture. I already took challenges from 2 p.m. Central Time till 4 p.m. I do play the people almost every day. Um, but this is more of a lecture. You want to play h5, I think, but you need to move the h6 bishop first. That's a good observation. Black cannot do anything, so we have time. Okay. 
Um, all right, so actually uh, around this time is where I started coming up with the idea of bringing the king over to the queen side. And I feel like it does make a lot of sense, just making sure that um, the king won't be in any crossfire, right, for whatever pawn break I decide to do on the on the on the king side. So king to f1, we maneuver, we just shuffled pieces around, um, or more like he shuffled pieces around, and I brought my king over to b3. Bishop to c8. So now is when you seriously start considering the pawn breaks, right? We had some brief mentions that about h5, and it does look very nice, right? Playing h5, and after g5, wow, the knight gets such a beautiful square here on f5. The thing is that after queen to d8, this bishop right here is a little bit weird, right? There is no immediate way to go after it. There is no immediate way to, to attack it. But it, it, it doesn't feel nice just leaving the bishop here on, on h7, right? So you could technically start considering bringing the bishop back and then after something like bishop here, let's say, playing h5, right? This is very similar to something that ended up happening later on in the game, by the way. Uh, but the thing is that I was looking at positions like this and I was just thinking, okay, the position is too close. Like, what do I do next, right? Because you have beautiful pieces, right? You have the beautiful knight on f5. But what does it attack? I have no more pawn breaks. Everything is closed completely. And my opponent can just play like knight g7, try to trade off the knight. Um, well, I guess not right now because there's going to be knight h6. But they don't even have to trade off the knights. Like I don't have a, I don't have a clear follow-up plan, right? Because I already closed it off a little too much. But it was an idea that I had. And, of course, f4 is always kind of in the back of your mind. But, you know, after it takes, takes knight g5, knight e5, the pawn on g4 is under attack. The knight on e5 is very strong. And if you think about it, my king is not super safe. The position just opens up, right? So I have to be very careful with how much I'm willing to, to give in to this position. And I think f4 is not the call. The other thing is pawn to g5, right? And that's the only the other pawn break. My main concern with this one is that um, if the if the f file opens, my pawn on f3 is is it gonna be weak, right? That was my main question while I was um, taking a look at this position. I wasn't entirely sure. Of course, there is not pawn to f5 because I can just take everything, and you know there's enough protection. But I was just, you know, just thinking like takes, if bishop takes or pawn takes, I kind of like pawn takes because it opens up this file. Unfortunately, it leaves my bishop stuck here on h2, on h6, so I wasn't sure if that was worth it. There might be some pressure here on f3. Uh, so I think that g5, certainly white can try and play, but there might need to be some preparation beforehand. So in this position, or I guess, you know, positions around this one, because white can kind of uh, move pieces back and forth, what would be the next step of the plan? Like plan number three, I guess, for this this structure for white. We gotta regroup some stuff. So how should Y continue? And like I said, it's more of a discussion, so just feel free to, to say whatever. Double rooks and have more control over the f-file. Okay, yeah, I guess we could double rooks on the f-file. Black weakness is h7. The thing is, how do we get to h7, right? Because it feels like black will always play pawn to g5. And it's going to keep things closed. Maybe put the bishop on h3. Ah, I like where that's going. Oh, after g5. Well, the thing is that we really have to time out g5 correctly because if we, they take and we take with the pawn, our bishop will always be stuck on h6, so we can't really attack h7. So 
I mean, we can take back with the bishop, but then the h file is not open. So uh, I was looking at all of this during the game, and it was so hard to to like find a sequence that actually worked, right? So there is no immediate pawn break that you know gives an advantage to white, but there is some maneuvering going around. An idea of bishop f1, bishop to h3 uh, was was considered, and I think it does make sense. However, maybe there is a piece that should go through f1 first. Another piece, I should say, that goes through f1 first. Yeah, good, good job, Sean. The king is on b3. Do you have any ideas now on how to improve the position for white? Because none of the pawn breaks work right now. There are two pieces that you can that you can regroup. Okay, I like where you guys are going with your ideas. I'm just gonna give it a couple uh, more seconds so more people can chime in and give an, uh, give a thought. Or if you want to just give a plan, you know, like a like a three or four move plan, uh, feel free to to do that too. Okay, so we mentioned bringing the bishop to east to h three, and you guys are also talking about bringing the the um, the knight to e three. I feel like that makes a lot of sense. Well, the b file is open, and the knight can get to b5, and there is potential for bishop a3, bishop b4, sacrifice. Wow. Um, I didn't even consider that. <laughs> I did think about bringing the knight to b5, and I think it's one of the possible ideas, you know. Um, I wasn't exactly sure what the knight was going to do on b5, because the king can just move to, like, b7, and then I, I wasn't sure what else the knight does on b5. It's kind of similar to when we were talking about h5, g5, knight f5. It looks very beautiful in an outpost, but I don't know exactly what it does. However, you know, you guys are right in the sense that the knight can go to f1 at first, right? So let's say knight to f1, um, black keeps moving pieces around, knight e3, bishop c8. Now we can do the second part of the plan, right? Um, we already improved our knight. It was more of in the edge, towards the edge of the board. Now it's more towards the center. It has the potential to jump to c2, a3, b5 whenever we want it to. And it also keeps on controlling f5. Um, and it doesn't get in the way of the, of the g file, right? Especially if we're going to open up some files with some pawn breaks. Um, so you have knight takes g5. I don't know what you mean with knight takes g5. But... Oh, oh, putting the knight on h3. I I think I thought about putting the knight on h3, but I, I feel like it's too awkward for the knight. Um, if we play h5, they're going to play g5, and I don't think knight takes works. There are just too many pieces from black uh, uh, protecting everything, so I don't think I don't think knight e2, knight g1, knight h3 is the best plan. But, you know, it's not... The thing about this position is that it's it's not super, um, it's not super decisive, right? What you do at, at the exact moment, you can take your time maneuvering the, maneuvering the pieces around, right? So, for example, this knight just came to a slightly better square here on e3. Uh, the next part of the plan, of course, is going to be taking care of this bishop right here. Oh, another thing that I forgot to mention: for the for the moment, the knight does support. Uh, c4, but the knight on e3 also supports c4. So whenever the bishop is on a on a6 or something, uh, our pawn won't be under any trouble while we're transferring our bishop to h3. So, for example, just bishop to f1 right now. Um, and all of a sudden it becomes a little bit hard for black to know what to do, right? Let's say king b7, bishop to h3. Do you enjoy getting into super close positions or was this intentional that's a very funny question uh because uh you guys are gonna see the end of this game in a few moves right 
and I was messaging my coach like I felt very fancy you know playing this position because you know it looks very Karpovian and I look I, I it almost looks like I know what I'm doing but in reality I was freaking out I was actually lower on time than my opponent he was just playing like king b7 king a7 and he was doing nothing and I was the one that had to come up with a plan there was so much pressure on me I didn't know <laughs> I didn't know how to play out the position entirely so it depends um it had like its fun parts where it's only me who can do something here and um and overall you know my position is better um uh, objectively but at the same time it's hard being the one that comes up with the plans right i feel like the more you practice these positions the more you enjoy them because uh, i would say that if black you know if white doesn't like playing these positions black is gonna hate it way way more right so um yeah why is it white the only one who can do stuff? Well, black doesn't have any pawn breaks, right? So f5 is never working. I have way too many pieces um, controlling it, right? Uh, black also can't play g5, right? Because then I'm going to bring my knight over to, to f5, open up the h file, and I'm going to be the one um, calling the shots. And essentially, I just have a lot more space in the position. The black pieces are a lot more awkward. You can see that my pieces have more freedom to move than the black pieces. And um, that's why, objectively, it's a little bit better for white. I would say, like, between plus one and plus two, more or less. Um, but there are only so little ways that you can improve your advantage, right? And this is certainly one of them. Bringing the knight over to e3, bringing the bishop to, to h3. And not only are you putting the pieces on better squares, but you also have some um, some tactical ideas now, right? Like um, this pawn can come over to g5, and the bishop can get into e6, right? So that's a that's a very strong square for the for the bishop. Um, it's not super clear still. It's it's just a game, right? It's just a game. So there's still a lot to to go off of. Um, but certainly white is one step closer to, to having that breakthrough that they really need in this position to, um, seriously seize the advantage. So, yeah. G5 makes room for the knight to go to G4. Yes, as well. So the knight, you know, the knight can possibly go to G4 in the future, especially after something like takes, takes, right? Um, the knight can even make it to G4. And overall, you know, it's kind of like step by step, slowly but surely, white can keep on building up the, the position, um, which is quite fascinating. It's just one of those positions that you can analyze and find all of the different plans that are being suggested. Um, and you can even, you know, put, present to the computer your own plans and see how, how they go, right? And if you're ever not certain of a of, of of a variation that the computer is giving to you, you can play as the opposite side, right? And see how it refutes your ideas. So yeah. Exchanging the bishop on d3 for the knight on d7 only makes f4 more attractive. You guys are really obsessed with f4, and I feel like my point of this lecture is to teach you to not play f4. Um, the the thing is that if you're going to play f4 you might need to prepare it a lot so you might want to put the rook on d1 on, on f1 the queen on h2 so that when you play f4 you take take with the bishop put pressure here on d6 maybe then but most of the time you won't have a breakthrough with e5 and e4 would be weak so i would say be very very careful when you are considering to break through with f4 i feel like certainly the the idea that we have right here is to play with g5 yeah the thing is that i actually didn't see any of this while i was playing i was trying to find i was trying to find what to do and i just couldn't for the life of me find what my idea was this kind of takes me back to when i was um a lot younger uh in 2015 i was playing the the national like some national scholastic tournament here in the US in Florida. <laughs> and it was round three. I was playing this slightly higher rated guy. We were like 1900s, okay? 
I was playing this slightly high rated guy. I have to go back and look at the game, but essentially I had a strategically better position. I think he had a backwards pawn and I had, you know, files for my rooks open. And it was just one of those positions where you double up the pieces. You don't allow your opponent to um, push the pawn forward. You put pressure on that pawn. You create a second weakness, right? And slowly but surely, it was almost like a Capablanca style game, right? Like where you just put so much pressure on the opponent and win. And I got to that position. I knew that it was one of those positions that was really good for me. And I was just thinking, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to play like Capablanca. I'm going to play like Karpov. I'm going to squeeze my opponent. I'm going to play like a GM. I can do anything. I believe in myself. I'm going to beat my opponent. Um, within like five moves, somehow I accidentally <laughs> allowed him to, to push the backwards pawn, trade a couple of pieces off, and then we got into an equal rook endgame. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it wasn't a bad result. A draw against a higher rated guy was still fine. But I was just thinking to myself, like, wow, <laughs> this is really not what I had, not what I had planned. So, uh, like, I thought about that game, you know, while I was playing this, and it was really hard for me to find another breakthrough in this position. But at least I'm glad that I didn't give my opponent any any chances, you know, for a breakthrough themselves, right? So, for example, right here. Um, the, the way that the game continued was with king a3, bishop a6. Um, I had some considerations of, uh, like, I'm going to show you. So queen e3, knight c7, rook h3, knight back, queen c1, bishop e3, king a7. I had some considerations in this type of position, like rook a1, bishop c8, queen d2, knight b8. Where is it exactly? There was something going on. We just shuffled pieces around for a very long time. But yes, so I would say that around here, um, I was kind of considering h5. Does the knight on g3 and e3 make any difference at the end? The knight on e3 is just more centralized, right? You just want your the pieces in the most optimal squares for when you are going to have a breakthrough, right? The knight on g3 is not necessarily bad. Maybe that's why the idea of knight of 193 didn't come to me. But um, certainly the knight on e3 just looks a lot better. And it also protects c4. It has the ideas that we mentioned, knight c2, knight e3, knight b5. It just makes more sense overall. But in this specific position, you know, I was looking for some position where I could play h5. If my opponent plays g5, I have knight f5 and I have the threat of this pawn right here and knight to h2, right? Knight to h6. So I was kind of looking at positions like this, trying to make this work. I think right now there is queen f8, which controls everything. But I was kind of trying to look for positions like this, right? And the thing that I realized is that sometimes, sometimes, even if I play pawn to h5 and my opponent, let's say, ignores it, doesn't play pawn to g5, just does something else. Um, I don't know, bishop here. After it takes, takes, it's not so clear because it almost looks like, oh, finally, I have, I have the file, right? I can work with this. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it's not so clear what's happening with this file. And if I lose control of this file, I am in big trouble, right? So I, I wasn't sure how much I wanted to open up the position either. Because this also didn't look so so nice for me. I wasn't so tempted to go into these variations. So finding that breakthrough that I really wanted was quite difficult. And eventually I just played rook b1 and played pawn to h5, g5, knight f5. This is how, kind of how the, how the position went. Is bishop h6 an idea here? Well, yeah, you can put the bishop on h6. That's where it was before. But at the same time, whenever I play h5 and g5, I'm concerned that my bishop is stuck here on h6. And at the same time, I just couldn't find where the breakthrough was. I was considering g5, but still, um, it's not so clear. Oh, after the file is open. So, okay, so you're saying like h5? Let's say like h5 right here. 
we were talking about this kind of something like takes takes um, rook here let's say yeah you can put the bishop on h6 and i even consider you know doing something like this and then maybe even having ideas of bishop f8 but i always thought that okay what next like i, I wasn't so like super super sure of like what was the next plan i guess i could go for this and then try to play like rook h3 and queen h2 or like rook uh rook h3 rook h2 and then bring this queen back maybe it is possible maybe it is possible but it, it almost felt like it was a lot um a lot of pressure going on and this bishop h6 kind of gives me the same vibes as bishop a7 in that famous Karpov game so i quite like it uh yeah, maybe now, maybe now it is possible. Maybe now it is possible. Uh, so maybe it's it's not so easy for my opponent to just leave the h file open. I thought that he would have some chances in a couple of times. Maybe it was just my brain seeing ghosts, but I thought that it would be. Uh, I, uh, I thought that it would be maybe a little too difficult. But I mean, of course, the thing is that he can always play g eight, uh, g five, right? And suddenly it's not so clear. Mm. yeah so the thing is that he has bond to g5 and my net on f5 is beautiful right it, it, it just it looks amazing uh but the thing is that after after queen to f8 just play like carpov yeah after queen to f8 it's not so clear what i do now i feel like everything is too close now so queen b2 i was trying to go for something on the on the queen side Honestly, I really wanted to make some sort of bishop take c5 sacrifice work, but it never did. So, <laughs> um, it, it never works. So, queen b5, my only plan is try to get into, my, my only plan is try to get into c6 and maybe go after this pawn. But the thing is that I don't think that is working. Rook b1, queen b2 are great, but the knight on d7 is controlling it, so... If I can get your knight on e6 and force a trade. Yeah, but I can't really get my knight on e6. That's the thing. It's quite difficult to... To piece these things out. And the thing is that the knight on a8, and funny enough, the knight on b8, it looks so silly. It looks so stupid, the two knights back there. But how do I break through? There is no way for me to... There's no way for me to, to actually break through. Yeah, you can put the pawn on h6 and play knight, knight g7 and knight e6, but the bishop is just simply going to take it, and then rook e7 probably takes, and it's not so clear what to do, right? So by this point, I was kind of realizing that, okay, the position looks really good. I have a lot of space. I have pressure on the b file. I have a monster knight on f5, but there's not, <laughs> there's not any more I can do. Like, the position is just too locked up, right? So after... Uh, I played rook to b2, bishop takes f5, pawn takes, queen e8, bishop e4. My opponent and I agreed to a draw, and this is how the game ended. So, there was just uh, not much more that was available by this point. The position is at about equal. Uh, even if we trade queens, I don't have any breakthroughs, right? Like, f4 never works. Um, h6 does nothing. I don't have... I don't have anything, right? So, yeah. Um, it's it's too locked. Yeah, it's too locked down. And I can't do much. Um, uh, yeah, there is just not much. Try and get away with ampassant. That is funny. Um, yeah, so there's not much more that I can do in this position right here. It's just kind of all too locked up. Um, however, I felt a lot more proud of myself playing this game than the previous one um still you know this is an international master it's not a it's not a um it's not a not 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 like a silly player or anything um so i still felt very nice making a draw against him and i felt like i gave him a good fight obviously i could have played even better um especially with that knight f1 knight e3 bishop f1 bishop h3 idea uh, but you know, it was a very rich game. There were a lot of a lot of um, interesting ideas, and 
overall i felt like i played quite nicely um obviously yeah could have played better but i feel like i played quite nicely i didn't make any blunders i didn't let go of my advantage in such a bizarre way so you know it's kind of complex but it's kind of complex but you know still very interesting and i feel like this is why you guys should certainly try to go over whatever mistake you do in tournaments and try to fix it and um you know probably the 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 fastest you're aware of it the easier it is for you to 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 fix that mistake so certainly it is a a thing to do while you're playing tournaments especially like this one because this one was one round per day so i actually had the time to go over my mistake and make sure that i wouldn't do it again right and i think it was a quite quite a nice tournament overall um i drew against uh 12300 i drew like two grandmasters uh one of them was ngaski actually from the united states um yeah i i feel like i played a pretty decent tournament overall still the game that i lost kind of pains me a little bit it was the only game that i lost but um i think it was a very nice learning experience though yeah okay so that's kind of the end of the lecture for today thank you so much to everybody that was here watching uh feel free to subscribe donate follow i don't know whatever you want um <laughs> and i'll be taking care of more of the lectures throughout the next two weeks as the grandmaster in residence and i'll see you guys next time Bye-bye.